Hey there, my name is Memo, this is my channel House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it around me and behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So for today's video I thought let's do plants that are challenging versus plants that are an easier alternative. And again, this is based on my experience and my conditions, but based on comments that I have seen from other people, I think this might actually apply to quite a few of you. And the way that I'm going to structure the video is I'll show you the troublesome or more challenging plant. A lot of these might be images because guess what? Most of the challenging plants are either really struggling or have not survived. <laughs> and then uh, I'll either bring you the alternative plants to see or I'll put a picture on because some of these alternative plants, even though they were doing really well, were a part of a purge at some point that I did of my collection. So I don't necessarily still have them, but I will put pictures and talk around them basically. But yeah, I think without further ado, let's talk about the first plant. And this might not be a surprise to most of you and I'll put a picture here. This is the Scissors Discolor. <laughs> Anybody who has owned a Scissors Discolor will probably understand this. And I will say that some people do actually have some success with this plant. I know a lot of people don't. I am definitely in that category. <laughs> but you might be able to see the plant. When I first got it, it was very lush. Here in the UK at least, I was able to find this plant in a garden center of all things. And it was quite a large plant. Actually, no, I didn't get it from a garden center. I got it from a plant store, from a plant store owner who knew that I was looking for this. It was on the high double digits when I got it. I think it might be a bit cheaper now, I'm not entirely sure. But I had annoyingly since purchasing it from that plant store, found it in a local garden center for a bit cheaper. So I think they, they do become available at some point, usually around this time of the year, I find. So around kind of like mid towards late spring, maybe early summer. And yeah, you will kind of find them. I don't think the price has fluctuated that much. But yes, let's talk about the care of this plant. And when I say care, there's a lot of conflicting information online. I think part of the problem why this plant and I will show you this plant now as to what has remained from this original plant. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can see what has remained from that original plant. I think this stem is entirely dead now. It is in pod, it is in the soft watering. I thought this might be a good video to do because this plant is going to get composted very, very soon. I have tried to revive this plant several times over <laughs> and just no. Right, let me put this back and let's talk about it. Also, I think it's really important to show plants that don't go well, even in people like me who have got bigger collections, the reality is, and don't beat yourself up too much about it, we don't all get all plant care right for us, basically. So that's why I'm always a very strong proponent of get a plant that works for you with your care provision, basically. But yeah, I mean, this plant, in terms of its care that you can find online, this, the research that I was doing when I, just before I got it and when I got it, because it struggled as much as it did, a lot of people were saying high humidity, some people were saying uh, medium light, some people were saying bright and direct light. By the way, all of these bits of information that I am telling you now, I tried. <laughs> um, some people were saying you need to keep the soil evenly moist. Some people were saying you need to more or less let it dry out. Um, and let me touch on a few of those things. So humidity, in this conservatory, it's almost to the level of kind of a glass cloche most of the time. The humidity in here is very, very high. A lot of plants that would struggle without that high humidity do absolutely fine in conservatory like this. Um, the, the strong light didn't really help. The low light didn't really help. Letting the soil stay wet for too long didn't really help because it had very fine roots. Giving it obviously something to climb on was something that's important. And I'm trying to think, yeah, trying it in semi-hydro didn't work. 
there was a lot of things about people saying, oh, it's really easy to propagate. I did not find this plant easy to propagate at all. I tried with moss, it didn't really work. I tried in water, I think that's the one that worked a bit better. But yeah, as a whole, beautiful plant, don't get me wrong, I would love to be able to get the care right for this plant and potentially try it again. Also, uh, wow, forgot to mention, pest magnet, at least in my experience, both mealybugs, spider mites, all of these things loved this plant. So another issue there, basically. But the alternative that I do want to say about this plant is the one that I'm going to put up here. And again, this is one that was doing really well for me, but it kind of got gifted to a friend in like a plant perch. But it was doing really, really well. And this is the Cissus Amazonica. And I know that it's not as, the, the foliage isn't as beautiful and intricate as the discolor. It doesn't have the purple backs. They're both part of the Cissus family. The Cissus family, for those that didn't know, is either the same family or closely related to grape. So you will see with both of these plants, they'll throw out little tendrils and they'll wrap around things the same way that like um, a vine, like a grape vine might do. But the Cissus Amazonica was still a bit of a challenging plant indoors, but definitely an easier one. It didn't need stupidly high levels of humidity. The soil requirements were a bit more kind of straightforward. At least what I found is kind of almost letting it fully dry out and then watering it again. Light levels, it did okay in bright and direct. It did okay in bright. I never tried it in low light. But for me, the Cissus Amazonica, if you want a kind of tenderly kind of viney plant, for me, that is a better option. Yes, as I mentioned, the look isn't quite the same. It doesn't give the same effect because obviously the Cissus Discolor I don't know whether or not a lot of people might know this, but one of its common names is vining begonia. Obviously it's not a begonia, but you can understand why it got its name because those leaves are very, very ornate. But yeah, so that's I think the first plant that I wanted to kind of say, if you're thinking about getting a scissors discolor, maybe don't invest in quite a large plant as I did, maybe get something a bit smaller and see if you can grow it out. As I have said over and over again, and I will emphasize this, I do know some people that have grown this quite well. I haven't seen a lot of people that grew it quite well a few years ago do any recent updates on this plant. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know about its longevity because there was a point where I thought I was doing everything right with this and it was doing really well and then it just <laughs> disintegrated. <laughs> but yeah, but this is one that I know a lot of people want, but it can also be a bit challenging. So let's move on to the second plant. So the next one I want to talk about, and I'll bring a picture up here. I do have it but you'll understand why I'm using the picture here, which is the Stephania erecta with <laughs> aquatics plant. Uh, surprisingly, aquatics plant that is kind of difficult. And the reason why I'm putting the picture here is because it had some foliage on. I have got it, I'm looking at it currently, and it's got zero foliage on it. It's got, it's kept the stem throughout the winter, but it's got zero foliage. It might come back again. Is also a lot of controversy around the Stephania erecta because the, um, the cortex itself, when it's as mature as it is, when it started flooding the market, a lot of people, probably rightly so, were saying in order for it to get to that size, and generally cortex plants do take a while to build up a bigger cortex, the reality is that most of these were probably poached at some point from nature. And there was a lot of people that were pushing to get slightly smaller ones or starting ones from seed, because then at least you know that it wasn't being poached. But uh, that is one. And anybody who's owned, there's a lot of people that call it the potato, basically, because it looks a bit like a tuber and looks a bit like a potato. Uh, and a lot of people have issues because they would buy the tuber and the issue was trying to get it to sprout. Now, I did finally manage to do it. And I do think I've got another video on this. I think I've done it on here and not on Instagram. If I have, I will link it up at the top there. But the kind of long story short with that one is everybody just like keep it really dry it's a cortex it doesn't need to be over watered but actually in order to get it to sprout i found putting it in soil that was evenly moist and then putting it in um, a baggie to keep the humidity up really high and obviously giving it some decent light and keeping it relatively warm is what then made this plant sprout because the interesting thing with this is and i don't think a lot of people are aware of this the cortex, I think if I remember correctly from my research, in nature is buried underground. It's not sitting on top of the ground the way that most of us are growing it. 
but because it's in the forest floor there's like leaf debris and everything like that it's not as dense as it would be if we were to just put it straight into soil that's why a lot of people decide to grow it on top of the soil because of that but you can imagine if it was underneath all that leaf debris and everything that humidity level is staying quite high the, another reason obviously why we don't do it is it might cause some rot and you might lose the plant then however a couple of alternatives for this plant and there is a couple of alternatives and let me see if i can pick up both my stephanie erector currently so i can show you what it looks like and one of the alternatives Okay, so back with my current little potato, and you can see that I've got it in pond. Shocking, I know, for a lot of people that have been here for a while, but you can see there is a bit of a stem. I'm trying to see if there's anything I'm trying to grow. Maybe? Um, it's not got much of a root, but it's kept the stem, so I've kind of kept the stem there for it because at least it's kind of green, so it can help it photosynthesize even in the winter. Uh. But that's the current one, and let me show you the alternative. And the alternative is, and do apologize, it's a bit crusty and dusty at the moment. It's one that I do manage to keep all the leaves on during winter and it's only just now starting to pick back up and bring out new branches and new leaves. This is a very, very odd looking plant. And you can see again, it's a cordex, it's slightly different. It's not that little bulb at the bottom and the leaves are different. It's not got that, those umbrella leaves that the Stephanie Erector will have, but this is a Philanthus mirabilis or mirabilis. I'm not entirely sure how you'd pronounce that. You can see some of the new growth that is coming in right there. And they do come in this coppery color and then obviously they go green. The leaves are kind of green. But the interesting thing with this, barring the fact that this is a much easier plant to A, get to sprout and B, get to continue being happy. I've got this in a terracotta pot. I've got it in an aroid soil mix. Originally I had it in a cactus and succulent mix, but it could take the aroid mix purely because I was getting to the point with the cactus mix that I was having to water this every three days in the summer, which is ridiculous. So it can grow quite quickly. And you can see as I was saying that the growth is starting back up again now. But the really interesting thing with this, for all those people that like the notion of kind of calatheas, and any of the prayer plants or even the sensitive plants where there's a bit of movement, this also has movement that happens. So at night, you can see the leaves are quite flat at the moment, they will close up. And there is a scientific word, and if I can find it, I will put it up here. But this is a very, very cool plant and not talked about enough. It didn't get as much press, I think, because the leaves aren't quite as kind of little discs and little umbrellas like the Stephanie Erecta. But for me, this is a bit more interesting because it actually does something and it's a lot easier to take care of. So definitely check out the, ooh, the Philanthus Mirabilis and <laughs> the other one as well that I will say I will give an honorable net mention to. And I don't think I've even got a picture of this. It's annoying because, and I'll, let me put this down. It's annoying because I only just recently chopped all the vines off because it was getting mealybugs. And actually with that plant, I've done that in the past and it's done really well, which is the Dioscorea elephantipes. So, <laughs> so elephantipes, again, I'll bring in some of my Greek background in here. I'm assuming it's because it kind of looks a bit like it. I think it's also sometimes known as elephant's foot. Which is interesting because for me, it looks more like a turtle back, especially as it matures. And actually, let me bring up the tuber so you can at least see the tuber. As I said, I've cut off most of the vining leaves. That one vines, which is kind of cool, is very, very thin. And the leaves are kind of little heart shapes. It's really, really cool. More reminiscent of those delicate, delicate leaves that you get with the Stephanie Erector. But yeah, let me show you. So you can see the remnants of the trellis that it was growing on before. And you can see that I have actually just cut that off recently. Because we're coming into the right time of the year now, it will probably regrow back. But if I show you the cordex around there, and I do encourage you to do a quick Google search online and see what this, what these cordex looks like when they're a bit more mature. For me, they just look like a turtle shell basically. So it's really, really cool. But another one that's a lot easier in terms of its care than the Stephanie Erector by far. Coming into a plant that a lot of people are probably getting quite excited because it's starting to kick back in again because it's that time of the year now. It's kind of late spring towards early summer. You'll start seeing a lot of your caladiums coming back. And I'll put pictures up because most of my caladiums aren't yet at the stage where I can properly show you with foliage and everything like that. It's that time of the year now where it's... <laughs> they're getting going, basically. <laughs> but if I bring up 
one that I wanted to talk about, and it's not just this one, I've, it's only because I've got the spring fling, which I'm showing you here, which is that pinkish, almost papery white, uh, see-through almost leaves, and it's only got a very green border around the leaf. As an example of a lot of caladiums that are very highly colored, but not colored green. So the reds, the whites, the really strong pinks that have very little green on them. And this might not come as a big surprise to a lot of people, but it doesn't have an awful lot of green. The green is generally the most efficient part of the plant at photosynthesizing, which generally means plants like the spring fling, caladium, won't be doing or won't be growing anywhere near as fast as the more green version. So I'll bring up another plant now, and this is my <laughs> Caladium frog in a blender. <laughs> and when I still had my frogs, this was the, the plant that had the, the <laughs> he who should not be named plant essentially <laughs> around the frogs. Ironically enough, this Caladium used to sit right next to the frogs as well. So bad. But this had a lot more green in it, which basically meant that this specific caladium, like the more green, the, the frog in a blender caladium, grew like a weed. As soon as it was comfortable with its location, it grew like wildfire because there was a lot more green on it. The spring fling, it's been getting bigger and bigger every year because if you know anything about caladiums, the, the, um, the actual tubers or the corms that they're growing out of are, they will get bigger each year and you'll probably get bigger, more impressive foliage and more dense foliage as well. There'll be more kind of growth points coming from it. But yeah, definitely. And this doesn't just apply for caladiums. Any plant that you get that has got very, very colorful leaves and there is an alternative of the same plant that is much more green, guess what? The green version will do a lot better than the colorful version in terms of speed and kind of size of growth, because obviously the faster it grows, the bigger and more impressive it will look. Faster, obviously. But, and that's just to do with the fact that the more colorful, prettier ones will not be able to photosynthesize as efficiently. Another one, and again, I don't think I'm looking at my list, I don't think it's one that I was planning on mentioning, but Aglianemas. <laughs> There's a lot of people that are twitching in the corner because apparently it's supposed to be one of those really easy plants, but I'm glad I'm not the only one that struggles with that plant. I think there's a lot of people that did struggle. I think Aglianemas are definitely the kind of plant where if you are, if you practice kind of benign neglect and you're a bit more of an underwater rather than an overwater, that was definitely one for you. But with the Aglianemas, there's a lot of very, very beautiful, very colorful leaved Aglianemas. Aglianemas, even the green versions, can be very, very slow growing. So can you imagine, like I had some of the more colorful ones, I actually have to give them away at some point because I'm just like, this is doing nothing for me. It ain't dying, but it ain't doing anything. And that was after a couple of years. The, the colored ones, I think you need to have very, very specific conditions. They can do them obviously in plant nurseries. I couldn't replicate it. And as I said, at the very beginning of this video, these are based on my experiences. So I just wasn't willing to sit around and wait. I have got one <laughs> tiny aglianema that's a green, one of the green aglianemas because everybody would just like, at least that grows a bit more consistency and they're less temperamental. And I bought it to challenge myself and I can confirm that it is less challenging, still slow. But yeah, let's move on to the next plot. So the next plot, I do actually have one to show you. It's looking very crusty and dusty, but it's just because of how it's set up. And this is the Raphidophora cryptantha. And you can see mine's a bit kind of janky and there's tendrils coming off the side of it and there's probably some salt deposits on the top. It's not harming the plant, it's still in active growth and you might be able to see it there. But this is a shingler that you can kind of get and it's not a particularly cheap shingler. I can tell you why it's not a cheap shingler because this is, at least in my experience, a very, very slow grower. And if you're gonna want a shingler that's gonna get a bit impressive at some point, this ain't it for me, basically. It's, it's a lovely plant, and as I said, I have started attempting this now in my bio orb terrarium with some of the other plants, and because I've got a, a piece of wood and I've kind of lent this against this, I'm trying to see if that environment where it's more stable in terms of humidity, more stable in terms of like the light source and all of these things, whether or not it's going to do any better, uh, it's not doing great. Like it's been a nearly a year now and it's still, 
okay plant, and if you want to get it for your collection, I don't necessarily regret getting this. Would I buy it again? Probably not. But it's it's an interesting plant, but there is a better alternative, at least in my opinion. And let me put this down and I will show you a picture of that because it's on my wall now and it's a pain to film. So the easier alternative for this is the Monstera Dubia or Monstera Dubia. I'm still not entirely sure. I think everybody, I went to Plant Swap recently, we were having this discussion. It's just like, is it Dubia? Is it Dubia? I'm just like, I don't know. Use both, it's fine. Um, but this is a much more rewarding, at least in my experience, shingler. That as long as you give it a plank, I've actually put it on my conservatory wall for the people that have seen the conservatory tour. I'll put a link up here as well. I think there was a point where I panned out and you can see it there. But, um, and the, what I did there is instead of putting it on um, a cork board with moss, I just literally laid down some waterproof membrane, the kind of stuff that you would put in under a pond in the garden and attach it to the wall because a lot of these shinglers, they could really dig into kind of brickwork and everything like that. And I didn't want that to do it, but it can still attach to that uh, membrane. So it's fine. And it, it keeps a bit more of that moisture anyway, which the plant I think would appreciate. But it definitely, and this is when it was first starting, it definitely grows more fast, basically. It does start to size up. So it starts getting a bit more impressive. The leaves, are a bit more interesting as well. In the mature form looks almost entirely different to the shingling form. It starts looking a bit more like a monstera with the fenestrations and it's because when it reaches the top of the trees, it will then start hanging and get much larger leaves. It shingles all the way up basically. And you can see it starts growing up. It's really cool because it really proves that kind of notion of they'll start off really small at the root of the tree because they're not getting as much light. And as they're getting closer and closer to the top of the tree trunk, and they're getting more light at that point, you'll start them getting bigger and turning into almost a different looking plant. So yeah, the Monstera Dubia or Monstera Dubia, much better alternative to the Raphidophora cryptantha, just purely because it speeds, its speed is a lot better, it sizes up, it's a bit more impressive. Their care, I would almost say is quite similar. The Raphidophora cryptantha, I was sold it without a, a pot of soil in the bottom of it and it's just rooting on the moss and maybe that might be doing that wrong. If you're doing really well with your uh, Raphidophora cryptantha, do let me know down in the comments below. But the Monstera Dubia or Dubia, I've always seen people that have got at least a small pot of soil. Usually the pot of soil is tiny in comparison to the rest of the plant, but there still needs to be some root going into soil. And yes, obviously you still need it to be attaching to the moss pole, generally you do it on a plank or you do it on a wall just, and then that would attach on there as well. But yeah, for me, a much better plant, but I don't know whether or not that's a surprise to a lot of people because Monsteras are generally quite easy care and they will kind of just keep on keeping on, most of them anyway. I'll wrap up with a plant that has caused a lot of people, including myself, some consternation in the past. And I very rarely talk about more succulent type plants, but the one I want to talk about today is the string of pearls variegated. And again, some of this will apply to most variegated plants, but the string of pearls variegated uh, isn't the easiest plant to care for. <laughs> uh, the twitch in the corner. Um, and it's partially because the string of pearls, if you are confident that you are doing really well and you've kept string of pearls for many years and you know exactly what you are doing with it at that point i'd say try the variegated version i know a lot of people really wanted the variegated version they got the variegated version before they even owned the green version and it things go wrong quite quickly basically so my experiences with this plant and spoiler alert there's a reason why there's a picture here i don't have it anymore um it can go towards root rot exceptionally easily. You're also always a bit worried with this plant, even me who's an overwaterer, in the winter sometimes this plant didn't get watered for two or three months and I'm just like, that can't be right. At some point you're gonna need water because I've got you in a relatively warm environment. You're getting okay light because of artificial lighting. It's not technically winter for you and I get it for some of the plants outside where it gets really cold and all these things and I know some plants slow down, but wow though. 
Um, I did see some recent videos on this and a lot of people were saying you, can, you have to let the soil dry out completely with either this or the green version and spoiler the, the alternative to this would be the green version and I'll put it up here. But, uh, and I think that is, by the way, a string of pearls. That's what I boarded it up. It might be a string of tears. I don't know if they're the same thing, but yeah. Um, but it is one of those things that, and the string, my green string of pearls I've still got. The reason why I can't bring it here is because it's in a massive succulent planter that I did a video from a very long time ago. And I think it's on YouTube and not just Instagram. If it is on here, again, I'll link it at the top there. And it's just really difficult to move that around at this point, but it's still going strong four or five years later. That tells you something. Um, my variegated one did okay for about a season, a year almost, and then it just died a death basically. But yeah, with the variegated one, and again, this applies to a lot of variegated forms of most plants because there's less green, it takes longer for it to grow because it's less efficient at photosynthesizing. And um, it's just, with the string of pearls, you also need to be letting the soil dry out and then also waiting to see until the little beads get squishy and it means that they're dehydrated um, before you even water. So it might just have very, very dry soil for a very, very long period of time because essentially those leaves themselves are what is keeping the moisture. And apologies, there is a dog that's been barking for the last three minutes solids of this video. I don't know if it's getting picked up by the camera. If it is, I'll see if I can take it out in editing. Otherwise, I'm sorry. There's a lot of people that are not managing their dogs around here. So, but uh, yeah, I think that's everything that I wanted to talk about at the moment. And yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.